to you too. Okay, it just said it will record to the cloud. It's probably so, a lot easier. <clears throat> yeah. So um, I had my second COVID shot and it has now morphed into a sinus infection. So I'm gonna make the show, show go on as planned. However, if you're unable to hear me articulate clearly because I'm stuffy, don't hesitate to interrupt. I'm gonna speed through a lot of this. It's really, it would be a really fun three hour discussion more than a PowerPoint presentation, but I'm gonna to try to do it in a half an hour so that you guys have a chance to practice, um, not just the validation, but some of the stuff that we'll talk about today. Um, so these are our new logos, just FYI. And um, what we're talking about is our nation's divorcing and we're charged with facilitating the civil compassionate and respectful co-parenting of our constitutional republic. Now what? As mediators and collaborative professionals, how are we part of the problem? How are we part of the solution? And Kevin, you said something before we got started. You wanna say that again? You mean what this presentation does and yeah. what it doesn't do? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we talked about it so much. We've gone through the presentation a couple of times. We keep having these really great conversations. And um, what I'm realizing is that the presentation kind of is a step-by-step. -step. And by that, I mean that um, it may not be how to dialogue with someone who just has an opposing view that might be coming at you with a lot of emotions. But it's, you know, at the very least, the first step of listening and also responding. So maybe it's not dialogue per se, but it's certainly staying in the ring and, and being able to um, either absorb or deflect some of the things that you're hearing and feeling and how to respond in a way that um, allows you to continue to have a relationship with that person. Yeah, I would say that's the biggest thing is you're choosing relationship over being right. And it, it pertains to how all of us do our work all the time, especially with a client, it's very different from it is from what it is or might be with a peer. But if you have a peer who's really entrenched in a position and has a lot of negative judgments about it, and you want to sustain that relationship, there are different ways that you could take what's given here and engage with that. So to give you some brief context, last time we practiced uh, the validation formula and how to apply that with, say, a client. All of this comes from dialectical behavior therapy. And one of the things they assume that I really like is we all do the best we can and we can all do better for a couple of reasons. That assumption makes it possible for us to level the playing field. It's not because it's true or it's a fact that everybody does the best they can. But if you approach someone with that assumption, you're not coming in defensive or aggressive. Um, the remedy for black and white positional thinking, we've talked about this a lot as mediators, is the middle path, looking for the middle path. And the middle path in, in DBT looks to seek the kernel of truth in, in opposing views. The idea of dialectic comes from Hegel and he used it to describe the evolution process. I'm not gonna go through the top part of this, but if you look at this part, can you see my little pointer? Yeah, yeah. okay. So you could say the thesis is uh, a report you know, the, the thesis is the Republican view that the uh, election was illegitimate. And then the antithesis would be the Democrat view that the, that the current elected president, that Biden is the rightfully elected president. And the middle path is the synthesis of those two and has kernels of truth from both the thesis and the antithesis. And I found an example of that, which I 
attached to my MailChimp this morning where a fellow really retains both kernels of truth from both the thesis and the, the, this, and the antithesis. And then what will happen is that if that, synth, that synthesis as evolution proceeds, becomes the next thesis, and then there's another antithesis, and then there's another synthesis. And without that antithesis, uh, and then the synthesis, there's no evolution or growth. That's the idea of it. Um, this is sort of a rehash of that. Like the thesis might be, he's the best president ever. Antithesis, he's the worst ever. Synthesis, some domestic policies were effective, but some foreign policies were not. So this evolution process with the antithesis, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis describes a ton of dynamics. Uh, Hegel used it to describe socioeconomic and Marx used it to, use, uh, to describe historical and socioeconomic stuff. It's been used for a ton of stuff, even including uh, parent-child um, interactions. There we are again. Um, so the the handout, we don't have 20 minutes to watch this guy's uh, YouTube, uh, but he talks about um, how the US democracy fails to represent its people and how to fix it. It actually, it's very nonpartisan. It validates both positions indirectly. It engages the kernels of truth and the values of both positions. It addresses systemic injustice for all people and therefore it becomes a uniting influence. And it exposes the divide and conquer approach of the elite, which is kind of split the two parties. Uh, well, more than split the two parties, they've been split, but positioned them against each other more intensely than ever before. So negative judgments. Um, how do they impact us and others? I talked about this a little bit last time. They alienate us from ourselves and others. Uh, negative judgments are fundamental, fundamental to positional views. When I take a rigid position, I inherently judge the other. Um, how does it alienate us? Well, it shuts down discourse. If I have a negative judgment about my partner, and I use the same example last time, if I even have, he happens to be a Republican, which is not always easy for us to bridge, but somehow we've managed. And um, without going dumb, you know, or discounting our own personal views. And if I have the thought, which I do occasionally, he's an idiot, for example. It's not a nice thought, but everybody th has thoughts like that. It shuts down discourse in that moment. It shuts down my compassion and it shuts down my self-reflection. If I'm busy thinking he's a, an idiot, I'm not thinking about my part of things. I'm not thinking about leading in to understand. So, these negative judgments are thoughts that trigger negative emotions that linger and isolate us. And that happens in all our mediations and collaborative cases. The negative thoughts trigger negative emotions that drive rejecting behaviors. Um, and I, you know, we talked last time about the Hidden Braid podcast that you can listen to that's also in the MailChimp. Um, we all judge negatively all the time. You're upset? Look for your own negative judgments and negative assumptions about the other person. In DBT, they consider that even diagnosis are suspect to, and, and that there's a potential abuse to negatively, to use diagnoses to negatively judge clients. And I have no doubt that's the case. The negative judgments slam the door immediately on leading in to understand having deeper discussions and having, uh, choosing being related to the other person. We stop at the judgment. Um, the remedy for negative judgments. The remedy for negative judgments is to observe and describe as a video camera would. So for example, instead of saying uh, he's an idiot, I might say he's passionate about a very different perspective than mine. 
all right? Uh, I have very different ideas than he does. Complaints, what comes, someone comes at you with, is that clear? Give me some nods over there, yeah. Okay, um, complaints, a long description of what you don't want. When you complain, like if my partner starts complaining about stuff, sometimes there's only so much of it I can listen to. So if he's complaining about politics, let's say, I'm not talking about me. Um, so you can invite the person to make a respectful request for the specific behavior you do want. And this is fundamental to all relationships. I mean, Marianne and I, when we're doing co-parenting, well, you know, and one starts complaining and listing a long list of negative judgments and assumptions, we directly block that person and say, what respectful request could you make for the specific behavior you do want? And it stops the list of the long list of negative judgments and complaints. Um, but the person who's making a request for the respect, like if I'm making a respectful request of you, instead of listing everything I don't like about you in this moment, I have to give up being right and I have to give up making you wrong in the moment that it's occurring. And I have to give up my desire to be right and be right by listing everything that's wrong with you. So if someone's upset, you can lean in and communicate understanding with this validation that we talked about last time <clears throat> that's a research-based method. Um, mindfulness, Kevin, where are you? Are you there? Oh, I'm here, I'm here and I was just I mean, waiting until you kind of got here because I recall when we were going over this before, so many of the tools that you're providing, right? I mean, are just tools for self-reflection and tools for mindfulness and tools for how you, I mean, first of all, how you approach yourself before you, you approach somebody else, right? And that's exactly that's what, that's what it feels like. I mean, you know, to get <clears throat> to the place where you're not engaging in negative judgment means that you have a tremendous amount of self-control and insight and um, just kind of a, it, it, and, and self-reflection. Yeah, there's a kind of re responsibility for self inherent in this that I had really thought about till you brought that up. And in DBT, um, mindfulness uh, the, is the access to wise mind and they call wise mind the interaction between your reasoning and your emotions and when you have negative judgments or negative thoughts it takes you out of wise mind and it it stirs up negative emotions and rejecting behaviors towards other people um adjusting our approach i actually um Kevin volunteered this quote, which I love, and the cartoon. Uh, the cartoon says, ousted, ousted politician, I advocate might makes right over peace. Um, peace cannot be achieved through violence. It can only be attained through understanding. And I, I argue that that's true in relationships as well. When someone's upset in our office and they're hostile or angry, it's counterintuitive to lean in to understand, even that that's usually most effective because with a client, you're trying to bridge that gulf. You have an investment in bridging the gulf between you and the other. Our impulse, this is everybody, is to judge, to try to control it, to set limits, to defend ourselves, to distance or terminate the relationship. Um, and I'm not saying you could, you should let someone get violent in your office, but um, let me see. I don't, I'm not sure. Oops. The little thing isn't showing here. Okay. I'm going to skip over the validation exercise for now. It comes up again later. It's a, it's a way to communicate understanding and a willingness to care about the other person's experience. It's deeper than reflective listening or empathy. 
It counters negative judgments, power struggles, and polarizations. It moves you out of your limbic system. The backside, I don't know if you guys can see me. Can you see me? Because I'm speaking, okay. Out of the lower brain stem and into the part of your brain that reasons, that plans, that considers ethics, and considers the consequences of your behavior. When people are upset, they are not in their frontal cortex. So reasoning goes nowhere or trying to persuade them. Validation leans in to understand them in a way that connects them. And it also helps emotionally regulate you. If you've practiced it, you can get out of your own limbic system and into your frontal cortex to lean in to understand. It creates a context for connection and trust instead of alienation. It requires and indirectly affirms the choice to be in relationship with this other person versus looking good, dominating, being right, or justifying yourself. Validation is not agreement, endorsement, or affirmation of the other person's positions, negative judgments, or values. You can't validate another person's negative judgments. You can look for and validate the thoughts, feelings underneath that negative judgment. Uh, if I, I mean, how would my partner, if I have the thought you're an idiot because he states some Republican perspective, how could he validate that if I were to say it? It's impossible. Uh, it's not possible to say it's understandable and reasonable that you think I'm an ass or that you feel contempt for me. It goes nowhere. It, if that that requires that you sacrifice your self-respect to validate the other person. So you can't validate a negative judgment. Um, effectively validating requires that you find the kernels of truth and validity in the other person's subjective experience. Um, I'm trying to think of an example off the cuff. I have a dear friend that's a Republican and what I care about is her experience, I have better yet, I have a client who is smart and capable and thoughtful and generous and an overarching decent human being. And he has a very strong sense that the election was rigged. I care and I could communicate caring about his experience based on his, the facts that he sources and the sense of injustice that he feels and the fear he feels about not being represented in the current government. I'm looking for the middle path, a synthesis, the higher values where both of us are connected. Somewhat like the mission statement in collaborative divorce. That's a synthetic perspective that we put together from both those views. And I'm giving you sort of a, a bigger theoretical context for understanding that, I hope. Um, and again, you equalize the playing field by coming at the person with the assumption that we're all doing the best we can and we can all do better. Um, validation has- Can I jump in just for a second? Please. Because I think a few slides ago, I know one of the, uh, I think it was under judgment or, you know, that um, one of the pieces was, you know, that you want the relationship basically more than you want to be right, you know, or something to that effect. And that seems like such an requires indirectly affirms choice in relationship versus looking good, dominating, being right, or justifying. Yeah. You know, I mean, and whenever I go through this with you, I mean, it's just so, again, I mean, it's just so powerful because that's just like one line on a slide, but you know, that I think that that's so much. <laughs> that's so much to sit with yourself and to say, I really want this relationship more than I want to be right. I want, you know, and. I'm not sure everybody feels that way about our democracy right now. <laughs> I'm not sure people feel that way sometimes in a divorce and they don't choose collaborative, right? Maybe they, they don't want the relationship. They don't care about the relationship. They're gonna go, you know, scorched earth. Um, it's right, really it's a, be it's a, right. It's, uh -huh. it's a conscious choice that people make that I prefer the relationship over some of these other things. And or the country, you know? 
the well-being of the country and yeah. and how can i describe that in a way or address that i thought that guy's little video actually did a really good job of that um and, okay and that's why i think so much of what you're saying just has to do with you know really people sitting with some of this information for a while and and, and really thinking about themselves and what it is they want i'm not sure i'm not sure we do that necessarily you know and right i wish it's like I said, it's a three hour discussion, but I'm hoping the exercise I set up gives you some time to play with it at least and think yeah. it through a little bit more for yourselves. So we did this one. Now, um, what we resist persists. And if it's like, there are all these studies from motivational interviewing where if I'm busy trying to convince you of something or persuade you to get off your position, basically you just get it more entrenched and you're going to resist be more. Um, it requires a kind of, validation requires a kind of radical acceptance of others as they are and as they're not. And when I gave my uh, usual child molester example, did anyone miss that? Because I could do it again if you want later. Did anyone miss that from last time? No. I missed it. This is Vi. Okay, all right. You know what? Because there's only one of you. Is there any more? Okay. I missed it too. I, I was in at the last meeting. Okay, okay, all right. So I'll do it in a second. Um, you're accepting others as they are and as they're not. There's radical genuineness. You can't fake compassion. It's gonna show if you try to do uh, validation, it requires this radical genuineness to do it effectively. It involves the tone, the nonverbal cues, the language, and that's the part that takes the most practice, I think. And the other piece to remember when you try the validation is that defensiveness is aggressive. Why? Because I'm relating to you as an aggressor, whether you intended that or not. So the minute I relate to you as defensive and well, I'm just defending myself against you, what I'm obscuring with a statement like that is that I've already judged you as aggressive or I wouldn't be responding defensively. And so that's something that we see a lot in our um, interactions with other people in all areas of our lives. Uh, the middle path, I'm not going to bother with this slide. There are a lot of synthetic values likely to connect in this, but I'm not going to focus on that. Um, apophenia was, it was in that, uh, one of the articles that I shared, and it really describes the hit, the dopaminergic, dopaminergic hit we get neurologically from thinking we're right and how that feeds our need to be right and our implicit bias. It can be an opening for us to have some compassion for ourselves and for others when they're busy being right or when we're busy being right, but it, it obstructs compassion in the long run if you're trying to do something like validation. And if I could just make a point about that, um, when we were talking also, um, I don't know about the rest of you, how much like you hang out on, on Facebook or social media. You know, I was, I remember very surprised, you know, just how um, charged social media became and, you know, certain innocuous things, you know, you start looking at the thread and everybody's just piling it on being really rude. And, and I, I made the mistake, you know, like a couple of months ago, like throwing my hat in the ring a couple of times, you know, <laughs> and, and like, that's not true. Da, 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 da. You know, he's really nice or, you know, that, you know, whatever. Um, you know, the First Amendment doesn't apply to corporations and it's perfectly OK that they do this and that and the other, you know, trying to like, you know, speak reason to whatever it is that's out there. But I found myself getting that like little dopamine hit, like wanting, again, wanting to be right and just throwing <laughs> and, and like getting beaten up and then realizing this isn't a very good forum <laughs> for trying <laughs> to assert, you know, you're right. And maybe it's, that's not the best approach. But I mean, I could definitely relate to the idea that there was something, there was a draw. It, it felt like a, I, I was drawn to it and I had to like step back and say, I'm just not going to engage in that anymore for a while. <laughs> but there was, it was, there was a pull. I think I did get a dopamine hit. 
I think we all do. Uh, I mean, okay, so the common positional language that alienates us, and I see people in practice groups do this all the time, and we do it in groups. These kinds of, this kind of language creates or strengthens polarizing positions between you and a client or in group dynamics, like declaring, I agree. If I make a statement and Kevin says, I agree, there's pressure to agree with me or I disagree. There's an opening to polarize against me uh, or saying that's right or that's, that's wrong, that doesn't sound right or yes or no even. The alternative, when you're working with a client especially, but I'm we're using it in this context now of the political divide is, huh, I have a different idea about that. And if you can see my hands, instead of doing this, yes, no, I agree, I disagree, which happens all the time in collaborative processes, you have an alternative which says, huh, and you come up alongside the person and just say, I have a different idea about that. Um, it stops you from joining or creating a side or being perceived that way. Um, it's not likely dialogue is going to come out of this, what I'm sharing today, unless the other person is equally skilled. Uh, we have no business expecting people to be other than who or what they are, including clients, friends, family, and intimate others. The best predictor of their future behavior is their current behavior. While there's a dialectic, there may not be a real dialogue when you're doing validation. I just wanted to be clear about that. And Kevin helped me clarify that. You also, depending on the relationship, you want to know where your limit is, especially about long harangues, about what's wrong with you or negative judgments. I mean, what I will take from a family member is really different from how I'll sometimes approach it with a client. Um, it depends on the relationship context. Um, we have different ideas about this. Um, would you please let me know the specific behavior you do want? Um, and then if I have someone just coming at me that isn't a friend or a client, or maybe they're a friend, I'm not interested in telling you who you are or judging you. I do want you to care about, I wanna care about your experience and I'm asking you to care about mine. That's that's where you're coming from in this way of bridging positional views. What could you reasonably expect? What you could expect is gonna depend on the professional client relationship, the nature of your personal relationship. Um, personally, oops, personally, oops. Did I miss that? Let's see. Where's your limit? We did that. Did that. Did we do that? You're right here. That you're okay. right here. Uh, professionally, um, Marianne and I will actively block and redirect. Well, I'll just say no. Stop. No. Nope. You guys can do that on your own time. Tell me X Y Z. And I know it's really hard. And if we need to go outside, we could do that or go to a a caucus. Um, let's see. And we train up their uh, more effective skills. Okay, so here's the validation formula. I'll give the extreme example. It's, uh, it's of the child molester because I, I guess what I want you to hear is that I'm not aligning with that person's view. I'm not agreeing with them. I need, I'm assuming that the person is initially is new to therapy and I'm trying to make a connection with someone who has reason to believe that 99.9% .9 of the population will judge that person harshly, okay? Um, it's understandable that you would, and now I'm gonna think about their thoughts, that you would think about young girls and feel sexual attraction to them and have the impulse to act on that given, now I don't care whether he, like if I'm going to biology, I don't care if he slept last night or didn't take his vitamins. 
I don't care what is current. Well, I kind of care about his history and his current context. So I'm going to address those. So given that your mother and your grandmother when were angry, dangerous people, the adult women in your life were angry, dangerous people. And given that, I could see how it would be very hard to imagine an attachment with an adult woman. And what I'm wondering is, now I'm on four, what I'm wondering is if we could talk about this because if we don't make a shift in that attachment, the current context is that I don't want to see you gang raped in jail for years to come. All right. So did anybody hear me endorsing that person's perspective or behavior? Was that hard? Okay, I don't see everybody, so like we see. Well, you. it seems like you you gave him an understanding, though. Yes, but um, I could understand how he would get where he got, and I'm hoping to eliminate judgment and shame because that'll just stop him from moving forward. I mean, I do want him to have appropriate shame, like no, this is not okay, and there's going to be a lot of denial about that and stuff to work out with molesters, but. For the example, that's what I was really going for. And then we so, practiced, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I, I just had a quick question. So that was, that, that's always amazing. And I, you always do this for my students. I'm always amazed by it. Um, and I'm trying to put it into the context of the political. And I was hearing what you were saying earlier about when someone just attacks you personally, you're an idiot, you're, you know, something that there's really no way to validate that. Um, but. I don't know. What if there's like a blend or something? <laughs> you know, I think you if, can. I think you can in some ways. Right. But I mean, you and a, all of your whatever Democrat or Republican friends are just a bunch of idiots because you believe that, you know, I mean, fill in whatever it is that, you know, you think the other party believes, um, you know, so. And, and so is there a way to is there well, a way, way to, I might? I mean, I could take a stop. The way I might do it is, I think that we have very different ideas about this. And I think it's understandable that we do, given that we're sourcing our facts from completely different sources. And that we feel passionately because our sources are all aimed at creating moral outrage. And that is splitting us as friends or upsetting our connection right now. So I and, like what you did there because you said we, right? And so the second you did we, I think it was more meaningful because you know you made it about- I'm not gonna engage the judgments. I mean, I'm not gonna engage them, but I'm gonna- No, but even if you use this formula and you said it's reasonable yeah. and makes sense that you would think, and whether a Republican or Democrat, the next thing is gonna say something to the effect because where you source your information, that's gonna feel judgmental. But because you said we and our sources of information, you, you lumped everyone together. And like you said, I mean, you kind of like got next to them and you lifted it together instead of, you know, and that was really important. That was a really important distinction because I was trying to figure out how to do it with this um, formula. You know, you, I, you but know. before that, I had to do the come up alongside the person right. with, uh, well, we have different ideas about that. And why is right. that? Well, it's understandable that we do because we genuinely believe the news sources that we're getting, right? And so it, I mainly, I was just trying to level the playing field and build a bridge that way. And by the way, that's the same thing that William Urey says in, you know, getting past no. I think he says, you know, first like go to the balcony, but then he also says, get beside them, right? So it's the same, it's the same techniques. Right. Yeah. Um, Let's see, so practice, practice. Um, so we're gonna do the exercise in a minute. And your job here is to focus on the thoughts and feelings of vulnerability underneath the negative judgments and care about the other's experience. You don't need to agree. And this is gonna require you to let go of your dopaminergic hit of being right and making other people wrong. 
So I'm not gonna, what I'll do now, let me see if I can get out of this, is uh, pull up the handout. I gave you guys two handouts. One handout is for the exercise today. And whoever has the shortest hair goes first as the professional. <laughs> and uh, glad you win. Uh, and <laughs> let's see. And then you'll need the validation formula to practice the validation uh, part of it. And so uh, like say, and what's going to happen is I'm going to have to hand over hosting, which because there's something wrong with our thing today. Let's see. Uh oh. Um, in the meantime, pull up your handouts for this. And um, I just made you host. Okay. And then, uh, how many people would you like in each group? Two. Two. Okay. All right. Hold on. Should I stop recording now that we're going into groups? No, you and I could mess with this. That way, okay. whoever listens to the recording could know what the exercise was. Okay, breakout rooms. So there's 15 of us. So should we do seven? <laughs> you know, I haven't seen you in so long. Nice to see you. About what they experienced and what that was like for them. What you noticed. Okay, let me break it down. Because <laughs> I can see nobody's job. Okay, when you found yourself saying, we all do the best we can, and we can all do better. Anybody have a reaction to that or notice anything? Kathy and then Patricia, because you're muted, Patricia. So. My initial reaction was, um, it kind of sounded um, maternalistic almost. Uh -huh. And it, it sounded um, it sounded kind of judgy. I could, as I, as I was saying it, I felt like I was kind of sounding judgy. And so I found myself then even more inclined to, to share my self judgments because then it was like, okay, now I'm being maternalistic. So now I need to switch to, I'm screwing up too, to fix the maternalistic behavior. Like I, I was kind of going back and forth between that. Um, but it was, uh, it was also challenging just to realize how, um, going back and forth between the political thing versus collaborative cases. That was another element Nicole and I talked about is how it's harder to let go of the dopaminergic piece in the political conversation. In the collaborative case, that one's like, I have no skin in the game. I just, I, I want to do right by my client, but I'm not, I don't need that dopamine hit to do it. So. Were you able to get to a place where you felt like you could say, we all do the best we can and we can all do better in a way that felt genuine to you. Yeah, it, it, it took a little bit. It didn't happen at first though. At first that's it was. Great, that's great. Yeah, the partner I was with repeated it several times until she could kind of wear it and feel it differently. What about the second piece for you guys? I don't have it in front because I have it in the screen. Um, did it, Patricia, you wanted to say something. Did you have something about the uh, judgments that you noticed? Yeah, I mean, I liked, so for us, we had a different experience with the, we all do the best we can and we can all do better. Um, so for me, um, and, and unfortunately my partner had to, to run off, but for us, like it started that open-mindedness from the beginning, starting out with that, because there was like that, we, you know, acknowledging we're all doing the best that we can we can all be learning from each other yeah and, and i'm not advocating that anybody actually say this it's just something yeah. they wear inside yeah okay so um yeah so for us that that was good and then um 
you know, some of it, it, it seemed like in that kernels of truth, it kind of seemed like we were grasping at straws to find the other person's perspective. But I mean, it, it was good. I, I liked it. <laughs> Okay, I would, did anybody have an experience? I'm trying to memorize these, but I don't have them up. Let's see, oh, yes, I do. Uh, kernels of truth. Oh, what about the negative judgments that you experienced? Anybody else? When the other person played a, a Republican or a Democrat, surely one of you had, I mean, you had a Nicole couple- Nicole had her hand up. Oh, sorry. So uh, Kathy and I were talking about um, when we're talking about our, our negative judgments, you know, the importance of acknowledging that we have them, but then also kind of struggling with how much of that are we supposed to actually verbalize? Because I, I think, okay, okay good. That's, yeah, that's good. Because, I wanted you to share it with your partner. No, don't share it. Oh, that's it. good. <laughs> okay. That. Thank you. That was a great question. No, zero. Don't share those. But know it and be yeah. able to own it and verbalize it is good. And then what did you notice about the door slamming when you have that judgment inside yourself? Well, I mean, I think it, it definitely, mm, I, I think that it, I think that if you're aware of it, I mean, it obviously has that potential to slam your own door and kind of keep yourself from being open and having the open exchange with the other person. But especially knowing that uh, we're not supposed to verbalize it, that helps a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think just being aware of it and keeping that in mind and sort of just keeping with the other steps. I think that it, it allows you to keep the door open, especially when you're talking about, you know, the kernels of truth that you see in the other person's experience. I, I think it doesn't keep the door slammed shut. It's just as long as you're aware of it and keep the, kind of going the through it. Is how fast a thought like you're an idiot goes through our head, right? Mm -hmm. So being able to track it and know that it's gonna slam the door. Mm -hmm. self-reflection as well as the other person is is what's key about that most mostly that's all I wanted for you guys from that and then uh how did the validation part go anybody well yeah, I this is Glenn go ahead yeah, well, I was just going to say, first, Stephanie and I just, you know, had, had trouble, uh, 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 you know, just getting a chance to know each other, you know, you know, uh, and, and not, ourselves, you know, like playing this, you know, this other, you know, uh, demonic, you know, type personality, because I, you know, she tried to be a Republican, so I'm a Democrat right, right off the bat. And so I said, okay, I'll play the opposite <laughs> side. So anyway, uh, but it was great. But I think the exercise, uh, on the validation, functions of validation, I just uh, noticed in this dialogue, it's just uh, a great exercise in, uh, as, as uh, Kevin said it earlier was, and a number of people said it is, you know, releasing your inner judgment. And, you know, you're just, you're looking for ways to try. You're looking for a way to creatively solve. You're looking for a way to move on without telling the person that you're right you know, but you, you know, you tell, you know, you, you know, you're telling them, you know, given your circumstance, upbringing and your, you know, exposure in the world. And, you know, I guess, you know, you know, you know, you can see how you might have that perspective, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I um, care about your experience. The only thing I would add to that is that I care about your experience, even mm -hmm. if it's really different from mine. Yeah. And and uh, and I think I I said that you know we you know in, in, in a different you know and not in those you know exact words was that look I have a different experience my experience is different and I'm a product of you know my experience so maybe like my dad the colonel used to say son the truth is usually somewhere in the middle you know maybe we can work towards find some place where we do have you know some understanding mm -hmm. and we we had an interesting. Um, conversation about the kernels of truth. Um, Jeff brought up something really interesting about, you know, the difference between certain perspectives regarding, you know, the appointment of Supreme Court justices and how 
we might be coming at something with a lot of resentments, right? Because there was the initial resentment, like for example, for example, um, you know, several years ago, um, um, when you know the Democrats weren't able to put through their guy, you know, um, and now when <clears throat> um, um, I'm sorry, hey, I'm, I'm, yes, yes, you know, got appointed so quickly, but. Then we thought back and we remembered, you know, that Merrick Garland wasn't, um, you know, didn't didn't go through because of the quote unquote Biden rule, you know, and so we were thinking, you know, how could we talk about this and how could we sit beside them and how could we make this into a we, um, you know, how could we make this into a, you know, we um, are, you know, we are experiencing the same thing and as much as we would like to get our Supreme Court justices appointed at a time when there's going to be uh, an election and there seems to be problems and frustrations and resentments surrounding, you know, how long, you know, either Senate should take or either, you know, yeah, Senate should take when that occurs. Um, you know, perhaps we could figure out how to do this in a way that everybody feels satisfied, you know, moving forward. But, you know, but also just acknowledging that there was a lot of like, there's, there's resentments coming, you know, behind Lower, everything as well. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where the history and context could come into the validation, right? Uh, that history and that context, the current context and the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that go with that history make a difference. One thing I noticed when I was doing it with Rebecca was that <clears throat> when I did it, I realized that I hadn't really talked about it before. She played a rabid Democrat, which was really interesting for me. And, and, and I had to be the Republican and um, really, and, and her complaint was that I don't do anything but you know suck up all that bullshit on, on Fox News, for, for example. And I, when I got to the feeling part, I noticed that I said, and it has to be not just upsetting, but sad and leave you alienated from me. That I would, that you, if you're thinking that I would deliberately source my information from a source that would um, be false and that I would do that in a way that alienates me from you. And there was something about that moment that connected us, even though we were on opposite ends. So I, I just thought that little piece was interesting. Anybody else, Matthew? I see you there. Yeah, we're just we about were, out of We time. were having trouble understanding what our uh, roles were, um, but we, um, or, or how to do it, quite frankly, but um, we, we traded back and forth a couple of times uh, and seemed to, uh, finally figure out how to uh, share some kernels of truth. That for us was um, pretty challenging. <laughs> each, each, uh, each one of us uh, coming up with a kernel of truth. Uh, I was partnered with Vi, who's not on camera right now, but. Um... Yeah, I, I, the receiver was supposed to be taking notes and then mm -hmm sort of keeping track of the time as you move through the steps as the professional and then you were switching roles. Anybody else have an experience they feel like sharing? Oops, I'm one minute over. I realize that some people have to go and I wanna respect their time. So please feel free to go if you need to. And if somebody else wants to share, uh, I'm, I'd love to